Hi everyone, my name is Mark Boost and I'm the CIVO CEO. And it's with great pleasure today that we'll be launching CIVO into production. I know the team is super hyped up about this and I hope you are too. First of all, I want to say a huge thank you to the amazing beta testers that have helped us get to the point we are today. They've really helped us shape the product and improve the developer experience and make sure that it's as stable as possible um, so we can, we can be production ready. Uh, a special mention as well to our uh, amazing um, uh, ambassadors. Uh, the ambassadors have really helped us along the journey. Um, they've done vigorous, vigorous testing across all of our platform. And, uh, and again, we, you know, we're really thankful for all that support. For me, it's our community that really defines us. So um, that help and support has been very humbling. Um, and yeah, thank you very much. Now, before we get into um, launching Sivo, we thought we'd do a little bit of a behind the scenes look at what happens when we deploy a new region into production. For a little bit of context, it's worth knowing that with Sivo, we perhaps a little bit different. The way we work is that we, uh, we use a system integrator um, that is an open compute specialist. Uh, an open compute allows a standardized design that we can uh, have that's very repeatable and easy to scale globally. It's very energy efficient too. It's completely tourless. Um, it's really easy to deploy. So we use a system integrator called Vespatech. Um, they're an amazing company. And they essentially build everything offsite which will be rack and stack, but also all the cabling as well. And then they will package all that up and ship that to any data center for us globally. Once it arrives at the data center, because of the software defined nature of the way we've built the platform, once it's plugged in, it will phone home and then self install. So in a moment, we're gonna walk you through that process and, and Dinesh, our director of innovation, is going to demonstrate that installation. And it takes only about 20 minutes, which we think is pretty impressive, but uh, we, we'll let you decide on that. But before that, we're just going to kick things off with a time lapse video, which is going to show you that journey from the system integrator to the data center. Oh, um, and one last thing. Anybody who signed up to our early stage access immediately after this video, uh, you'll be able to uh, access Sivo, you'll receive your invite um, and the new London region which uh, Dinesh is going to be demoing, will be live and ready to use. Okay, so on with the show.
Hi everyone, my name is Dinesh, and now that the servers have been safely delivered to the data center, I'm going to run you through the process to get them installed, configured, and ready for customer workload. This process takes around 20 minutes and is fully automated apart from an initial Ansible playbook that we need to run. With that said, let's swap over to the console and get things started. The first thing that we do is generate and upload all of the configuration the servers will use during OS installation and then first boot. This covers all of the disk configuration, network settings, and software stack needed. We use the latest version of Ubuntu, and that uses a cloud init format for both installation and first boot. We also generate config files for all of the routers and the switches in the rack, and like the servers, they grab this configuration from the web server on first boot. The other device that we make changes to is the outer band router within the rack itself. The outer band router only has some initial internet configuration put on it before shipment. As such, we need to configure the rest of the interfaces and add some static DHCP entries to each of the servers. We also add some static DNS entries so that we can do the initial configuration. DNS is really key for the operation of a Kubernetes cluster, and as such, we only rely on the outer band router during initial install. The software stack we run manages a resilient service through Kubernetes itself. Finally, we upload some files the servers need for boot and configure a TFTP server on the MicroTik to serve them up. Now that this playbook is finished, I'll swap over to the web interface for the outer band router. We're using a MicroTik here, so you may have seen this interface before. What I have up is the DHCP leases page, and we can see that servers are already requesting and being handed out IP addresses. What I'm doing is I'm just waiting for the first control plane node to get an address, as that's what we'll be following during the rest of the demo. Now that it has an address, I'll swap over to the serial output from the server. What we can see here is the serial output from the control plane node. We use serial over LAN, which is part of the NICs that we provisioned in each of the servers. The serial over LAN interface allows us to remotely configure and diagnose problems on a server as if we were in front of the rack itself and had a KVM plugged in directly. What we've just seen are some postcodes. These would help us find any problems with dodgy RAM or CPU within the server. Before shipment, the servers are configured to Pixie boot automatically, so we don't need to make any changes in the BIOS. However, if we did, we'd be able to do that here. As we can see here, the server is Pixie booting now. This involves getting an IP address over DHCP. And part of the packet returned by the router are two configuration options. This is the Pixie Next Server and Pixie Next File. The server downloads these files and then starts up Grub. We have two options in this Grub menu automated install or manual install. We'll let the automated install run through now. However, if we did have any new hardware, the manual installation is really useful and allows us to ensure that all of the drivers are required in the ISO that we use. As part of the startup process from the server, it will reach out to the provisioning server and request the cloud init files that we've pre-configured. This is the cloud init file used for install rather than startup and contains all of the information around initial network configuration and disk configuration. While that server is busy installing in the background, what I want to do is do a high-level diagram of what it takes to build a SIVO region. Starting with our core network, we'll add some spine switches here, and they're connected to two top-of-rack switches. All of our core network runs at 100 gig, and we add in bonded connections between each of top of each of the top of racks and each of the spines to give us 200 gig of throughput at each layer. The leaf spine architecture that we've deployed allows us to easily expand up to 10 racks in a region. All we do is add two more top of racks in the new rack that we deploy and lag these to the spine switches. Moving up a layer, we have two edge routers. So they're responsible for internet connectivity for all of our customers. These are connected in a cross to each of the spines, and this is probably the only place where we could have a loop. This makes configuration at a network layer really easy because loop protection doesn't need to be deployed through the rest of the stack. For internet connectivity, we work with multiple tier one providers in each region. We deploy multiple 10 gig connections back to each router, and this again gives us the resiliency we need. If there are any problems with uh, an individual provider 
or a physical connection in the data center, we've got resilience that allows traffic to be routed anywhere around the platform. This core networking design allows us to lose any edge router, spine switch or top of rack switch and still maintain connectivity throughout the rest of the rack. Let's move down to the servers themselves. So let me just move this out of the way and add in a compute server. I won't add them all in, but they all follow the same principle. So an individual compute server is connected to each top of rack switch and that's at 25 gig. We use this single connection for all storage, tenant and management traffic and we have layer 2 segregation here. The last layer of the stack to talk about is the outer band devices. We've already spoken about the outer band router that we use for initial configuration. We also use that for management access into the rack. We also have two out of band console devices that are connected to each side of the diagram. So all of the edge router, spine switch and top of rack on the left is connected to one console server. And then the edge spine and top of rack on the right hand side of the diagram is connected to another console server. This helps ensure resiliency and redundancy throughout the stack. To help with that, our, all of our out-of-band devices get their own WAN connections that's completely separate from our main transit. Now that that server's finished installation, let's just swap back to its output. So we can see here it's just about to restart. Again we get the pixie sorry, again we get the postcodes from the server and it should swap into the BIOS screen shortly. Now that the server has an OS installed though, rather than pixie booting, it will boot into the installation that we have on disk. Once the server started up, it's going to request the cloud init file from the provisioning server for startup. As this is the first control plate node, it will contain the commands required to initially bootstrap a Kubernetes cluster. All of the other nodes will connect back to this server once provisioned to get the security credentials required to join the server. So here we can see the initial startup of Kubernetes. Um, it's creating the initial certs for the region um, and what I'll do is I'll just log into the box, just make sure that everything is looking fine. Yeah, so it's, it's just taking a little while for that initial startup. It's got to download all of the images and uh, start up Docker. Excellent. So here you can see the kubeadm output for the initial joining tokens. Right, now that cloud init has finished, uh, let me bring up an SSH connection to the box here. So the first thing I'm going to check is that the kube API is up and running. Uh, it doesn't look like it's started yet. Let's just give that a second and give it another try. Excellent. Right, let's connect to the API and um, we'll just get the nodes. Uh, right, so we've got our first control plane node. This is the one we're connected to. And um, we should very shortly see the rest of the compute nodes and the control plane nodes join in. So those are the compute nodes. As I said, their cloud init config are configured to wait for the initial configuration of the control plane and then connect in automatically. I think the control planes take a little bit longer because they've got some more certs and etc. D containers that they need to download. There we go. There's at least the first one jumping in. I'll just get a, a fresh list of the node list. Oh, yep, no, all four of them are there. Part of the cloud init installation is also the creation of our SIVO stack operator. 
So this is an Ansible operator that carries on and does the rest of the configuration for us. It's also used during upgrades to allow us to deploy new versions of controllers and if there are any other new configuration to the servers that need to be applied, they're done via this operator. Just getting the logs out of it here um, is, I think it's, it's starting up, it's just ensuring that some pods are created. Uh, at the startup, the API is really busy, so some of them, some of the commands can take longer than others. Um, obviously, it's popped through. It's just added some RBAC config in there. Let me just grab the namespaces in the cluster. Okay, so we can see that kubevert has been added as well. We use kubevert to run customer instances. So every time you launch a Kubernetes node or a IaaS instance, we're actually running kubevert under the hood. Let's just see what's running in that namespace. So we've got vert operator and the initial API. I think if we give it another few seconds, it should get the rest of the, the vert handler pods up. Just getting a list of the other namespaces, we can see that storage OS is also starting up now. So like you vert, there is a storage OS operator. So let's just check if that is up and running. Yep, looks like that's good to go. Um, so we then create the storage OS custom resource and that then configures the rest of the pods required in the cluster. So we just look at the cube system namespace, we should see some storage OS daemon sets running. Which, which they're initializing. Um, going back to the namespace list, I think that's everything. So let's just go back to the Sivo system namespace and see what's running. Right, so we've got vertctl here, which is uh, required for us to start and stop machines. We run our own etc.d cluster as well, so make sure that we don't clash with any of the Kubernetes requirements. Um, and then up at the top, we've got our operators as well. So if I just talk through them at the moment, the disk image operator is used to control what IaaS instances and what IaaS images are available in a region. So if you launch an Ubuntu machine or a Fedora machine, the disk image operator is responsible for, for getting that raw image ready for use. It also has the K3S images that we use as well. The firewall operator is responsible for ensuring that Firewall rules are applied correctly in tenant namespaces. The instance controller takes our custom resources for instances and translates them into kubevert resources. It's also responsible for ensuring the state of machines as well. So if you're doing a node recycle or a node reboot, it's the instance operator that's taking those requests and performing them within the cluster. The IPAM operator is responsible for handling out public IP addresses. And the K3S operator is responsible for orchestrating how all of the systems work together to get a K3s cluster up. So for example, when a new K3s cluster is launched, it will request a IP address from the IPAM operator. It will then create some CVO instances that will run workload. Great, so with that all running, what I'm gonna do is swap back to my local machine and see if we can get a uh, instance launched on there. So the first thing we need to do is swap our region. So we're now using London 1. As so we can see here that we've swapped over. So now that we've done that, let me create a K3s cluster. So we're currently looking at launch times between one and a half and two minutes. Um, not sure if this first one is going to take a little longer in the region. So when we make this request, it's going via our API and that's creating the K3's custom resource uh, under the hood and that's gonna be in that individual region. So as I said, it's uh, requesting an IP address and that's being allocated to the cluster. Then instances are being created under the hood. Um, the CDI part of kubevert will be launched. Well, I guess before that, the PVCs are created. So that's handled by storage OS. 
we currently run with two replicas of every volume. And again, Storage OS handles that and makes sure that they're diverse across the cluster. Then CDI will start up. It will request the K3S image from the disk image operator and download those files direct to the PVC. Qvert then takes over and starts the instances themselves. And once they're ready to go, we'll SSH into the master node and get the config out. We'll then save that and make that available for use. The worker nodes themselves are pre-configured with the IP address of the master node um, and very similar to our control plane and very similar to our supercluster side, um, the worker nodes will join into the customer cluster. And there we go, 1 minute 44 seconds, so probably about average. So using the Sivo CLI, what I'll do is I'll grab the K3S config from for that cluster. I'll just save it to a file for the moment. And then using that config, we'll just get the nodes from that cluster. So we can see here we've got yeah, one master and two worker nodes, which is the default that we have when we request a cluster. So that's it. Everything you need to do to get a SIVO region launched and ready for use. It feels like a simple process, but the team have been working really hard over the past year to get us to where we are. The London One region is now live and ready for use and joins our existing NYC One region that we launched in January. We have some plans for two more regions for the rest of the year, so please keep an eye on our blog for the latest news and updates. If you're interested in trying out the service, you can sign up at sivo.com and we have $250 of free credit currently available. Hopefully you've enjoyed this, so please consider subscribing for more content around Kubernetes and the wider cloud-native landscape.